Well, here's a topic I've been wanting to explore for a long, long time. These are factory servings on paramotor cord. I believe these are aramid and polyester sheathed. Some of them might be Dyneema and polyester sheathed. And these are factory servings on the ends of these lines. So errantly, I was out and I tried to fly my PAP unit with an E-prop on it. And the E-props are notoriously sharp at the edges. And between the flex of the PAP cage and improper technique and the leading edge of that being so much sharper than the, the uh, helix prop that came with the PAP, I ticked the outer sheathing on both of these lines and pulled them off for replacement. But I saved them, and I encourage you to save all of your old lines, especially with fly-ins coming up, because if you're at a fly-in and you break a line, there's a way that you could maybe salvage flying with that same glider. So hear me out before you say, that's crazy, don't ever tie lines together. So no doubt you've seen this type of a knot, a connection of two lines at some point on your glider. And sometimes there's one simple connection like this, but more often than not, there's multiple lines connected to a single line at the cascade points. And when you pull these too tight, like this, they make that very familiar look and shape, right? And as the glider is loaded, and as the glider is loaded, it makes that shape. When we push these two apart, at that relationship, and that's considered standard connection. Now, I argue that if these lines were bigger than the diameter that they are, and we were using them in a hypercritical safety situation, like to haul the main halyard on our 12-meter yacht. I know a lot of you guys have 12-meter yachts. Instead of these being externally lashed back here, they would be internally served by a rigger who would take the Dyneema core and weave it back through itself and then work the whole thing back into the polyester sheathing, which protects the Dyneema core. It's a pretty standard argument that damage to the exterior protective sheathing on these lines does not compromise the structural integrity of the interior aramid or Dyneema core. So the polyester doesn't lend much strength to it. I argue that that's not quite true. And one of the worst enemies of these cores is dirt getting in there, particularly sand and grit. It can wear out that inner core. And even just the core itself has a fairly good amount of strength. So in order to get to those big line, like your A-line ratings of 300 kilogram breaking strength, um, it's best that this line's in good condition. So we're at a fly-in, we've chopped up one of the lines, and I'm gonna say that you can tie this. So we, we looked at this, now I want you to look at a square knot. So I've taken this two pieces of line and I've tied a square knot. And let me pull it tight and you'll be interested to see that it looks exactly like our factory serve lines once it's tight. So does that look familiar? It's almost identical. The only difference is these servings have lashed the bitter end, the, the part that's not under load, the unused portion of the knot, they're lashed by being sewn back to the standing portion of the line. It's basically the same exact thing. So you can properly mark these and connect two broken pieces of line, provided you have an extra length of line. And you can probably go flying with just this knot. Now, I caution you, the reason that these are sewn back here is to pre prevent the situation under extreme load where the load ends of the line pull enough to actually work the bitter ends out and backward through that knot. It's not very likely because of the, the strength of the lines and the way that they load. However, it is possible 
And it's probably not safe to just fly it with a knot like this, unless it's an extreme emergency. You're in a remote location, you <clears throat> are potentially in danger if you can't get extraction or walk out of that area, and your only choice is to fly it out and you happen to have a spare line. Maybe then, but certainly not for the long haul. However, we can put this in a sewing machine and serve these back to the standing line, and we can make up our own spliced eye ends like this. So let me show you how. It's just short of an inch. And I guess for you Europeans, uh, 23 millimeters. So 23 millimeters is about the opening and maybe 24 millimeters. And any bigger than that is going to be sloppy. Any smaller than that, and we might have a difficult time getting all of whatever this line is loaded with through there easily and lined up and fared nicely. So we're going to try to duplicate that one inch or just slightly short of one inch spacing on the line loop serving that we're going to create at the sewing machine here. And the way to do this is by using um, <clears throat> zigzag. A uh, slow feed rate, a fairly high line tension, and a template. So let me make up the template. It's basically just going to be a slit that I cut in this piece of cardboard that's about the same thickness, maybe just a little bit less thick than the line itself for double the line length. So I'll hold the cardboard with the line in, and it will run it from one end to the other through the machine, and we'll serve this serving happens to be about four and a half inches or about uh, 11 centimeters. And we'll try to replicate that on a piece of broken line. So here I've taken that piece of cardboard and I cut a slit in there with a pair of scissors and it just barely fits two lengths of line. And what I'll do is I'll stitch starting up here near where my one inch point would be and I'll stitch all the way down until the end of it is passed through there and I may have to slide the line through the template as I go to create that compression that keeps these two lines tight together now let's talk about thread the strongest thread um, is silk but the materials we're working with are synthetic so I think it's appropriate to use a polyester thread and a needle that's fine enough to easily get through the center core of the Dyneema or the Aramid. So you don't want to be serving just the outer jacket. You want to get through the core to make sure that that runout happens. And that's the reason that they stitch as many inches as they do, four and a half, five inches. It's because at least some of those punctures of the needle are going to penetrate the core, and that's going to prevent those two lines from shifting relative to each other. So let's try to sew it. Here, I'm gonna put this under the presser foot and I'm gonna lower the presser foot at about the starting point or where I think the starting point is gonna be. And I, I have the ability to flex this one way or the other just a little bit by really pushing on it and sliding it before those grippy teeth that engage the bottom of that fabric bite into it. I'm gonna make my first couple turns by hand and line that needle up right in the center of that first piece of line on the right side. It's kind of tough to see, and there we go. I punctured it right in the center. Now when the needle comes up, I'm gonna see if I need to adjust it over one way or the other. I'm gonna shorten up the amount of zigzag just a little bit so that I'm closer to sewing the center of each line. I'm gonna make my second one by hand track and make sure that my third one goes in there by hand. Now I think I'm ready to run the machine. I got pretty good spacing, good tracking, and good feed on the machine. So let's see if I can run a few stitches here electrically with the motor. You can see I'm moving the machine back, or the, the feed back and forth a little bit, just to make sure that I continue to hit the centers of the I'm getting to the point where my 
template's a little bit sloppy. So I'm gonna ease the pressure foot up and I'm gonna pull the guide, the template, further down onto the work. Now I could have made a longer template. That would have probably been the smart thing to do. But working with what I had here. All right, there we go. I'm gonna put the presser foot back down and continue sewing. I know that I, I feel that I had a couple miss, so I'm not the best at this, but that came out a little bit sloppy. And practice is really what makes this work. So let's try this again. I've increased the feed rate just a little bit to help take out some of the slop. Basically, I'm working my way down to the end there stop there for the sake of illustration and pull the needle back out and that's what we end up with right there not bad for homemade so they make a product called fray check you can glue these down or you could get in a couple back stitches at the beginning and at the ends of these servings I would caution the use of CA glue at the ends of these because uh, it, it tends to be brittle and it's going to react with the polyester of the fabric and who knows, uh, may even weaken the line with the heat from the curing process. So if you can't serve it back, think about leaving the threads long and stitching them back inside of there by hand. Or like I said, you know, use your, use your backup feature and, and get a couple back stitch locks at both ends of the serving. But that ain't coming out and there's probably about 95% of the needle penetrations are through both the polyester and the aramid core on this particular line. I think they look pretty decent and it would certainly extend uh, your flying if you chopped up a line. So next time you do chop a line up, don't throw the line out. Hang on to it and go borrow your Aunt Nancy's sewing machine and practice this. See if you can do this at home. And after uh, you pick up enough lines at fly-ins from buddies, or if you damage a few yourself, you'll have enough inventory to keep your glider flying without having to wait for somebody to make up lines and ship them to you. At some point, you'd probably want to replace this line. Instead of having a line splice, you know, order the right lines. I'm just talking about extending your ability to fly while you're waiting for those lines or saving flying in a fly-in.